Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. Are you looking for a way to connect with your loved one? Maybe an activity to do the next time you visit? Something other than sitting around and answering the same questions over and over again like we always seem to do? Let me tell you about some books that I discovered that changed the last visit I had with mom tremendously. They're called Two Lap Books. They are simple, read aloud books for memory challenged adults. You see, people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementias gradually lose their ability to initiate communication with others. Because of this, these uniquely adapted books, quote, give voice to these loved ones. By using the book's large, simple text and colorful illustrations, we can initiate conversations. Most noteworthy, reading books together can make meaningful connections with our loved ones and help stimulate their mind. Caregivers will enjoy sharing these books and creating purposeful, interactive activities for engaging people with memory deficits. Best of all, reading these books together will very likely bring out memories that you can share together. I've made it super easy for you guys to check out these books. The link to the Amazon page is in the show notes, so give it a click. I know you and your loved ones will get a tremendous amount of enjoyment together reading these books. Mom enjoyed them, her friends enjoyed them, and I enjoyed an afternoon with them like I haven't had in a very long time. With the winter months coming, Mom and I won't be able to go outside on our little adventures, so we'll definitely be reading these books a lot more as the colder weather envelops us and keeps us inside. I've got another slightly different episode for you today. All of this is in keeping with my desire to bring you as much useful information, as much helpful information as possible. So if there's something that you like a lot, let me know, and I will make sure to do more of them. If there's something you don't like, let me know that as well, and maybe we won't do those again. Today's episode is with Sarah. She is with Alert Sentry, and they are a personal emergency response system. You'll hear in our conversation that this is more than the help, I've fallen, I can't get up alert pendants, but it's along the same lines, just much more updated and better technology. Alert Sentry is committed to providing extended personal freedoms and safety, both at home as well as on the road. They have they achieve this through leading edge technology that allows them to summon help whenever the need should arise. Alert Sentry has been serving clients throughout the United States for more than a decade. Their systems have earned a national reputation for quality, service, and performance. So let's listen into the conversation with Sarah and find out more about these useful devices. Quick thing, Sarah and I had an issue with the online recording. So we kind of went a little old school and I put our phone call on the speaker phone and used my little ninja recording device that I carry around with me. So the quality is not as good as I would prefer, but the information is still worth listening to. Another quick thing, this is not a sales pitch episode. We got into conversations about our family with Alzheimer's and dementias and stories we've both heard. So there's a lot more information in here than you might suspect. So let's tune in. All right. All Now that we've got the technology solved, I hope. Hopefully, (laughs) yeah. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell tell me about your products? Okay, sure. My name is Sarah with Alert Sentry. I've been with them a little less than a year. So um, I've done quite a bit of learning about the industry the medical industry and um, our products, I've learned a lot in the past year or so. Um, So what our whole point really is, is to make sure that people are aware of personal medical alarms. Um, So we have everything from the very traditional, um, you know, the button around your neck that works only when you're in your home to a product that you are able to leave your home and have the unit work through um, a cellular GPS. 
So um, as technology changes, Alert Sentry is definitely keeping up with the new technology and providing um, you know as m much as we can with um, what new features are available. So, um, so whether you have a landline phone or you have a cell phone or you don't have a phone at all, you have an option with uh, one of our products. And we also do offer an option for fall detection. So um, not only do you have to push the button, but if the unit detects that you've fallen, it will prevent. Uh, it will provide a um, like a wellness call to you to see if everything's okay, and if there's no answer, help has been sent. That sounds good. Now, uh, bef yeah. before we um, go on with with um, the products, when we were chatting online, you said you had was it your grandmother? You had a family member that recently passed from dementia. Yeah, my grandmother did. Okay. So she was living in um, an apartment at first, and then as things began to um, progress, where we realized that she was kind of becoming a little um, scared or paranoid with thinking that people were coming into her home or and things like that. So it was just very strange because that was well out of her um, personality. So... Um, and she had fallen a couple times, and so my family had decided to put her into an assisted living facility. And um, while in there, she did have a button, and there was nurses and uh, staff available to help her out. Um, but again, it just things started to get worse with her memory to the point. Um, I remember the first time I realized it was, um, yeah, she passed away in February or January of this year, so it was probably a good year ago that um, I was talking with her, and she said, so how are things going? And so I started babbling away, and then um, her next thing she said was, so how are things going? And I, I kind of laughed to myself, not realizing what was going on, um, and I, you know, kind of repeated myself, and and then again, she did it, and she just kept doing it. And so at first, I kind of chuckled, like, um, it was just kind of strange. And then I realized what was going on is that sh her short-term memory was just completely gone. And she was asking me the same question over and over in the same tone and totally acting interested when I responded. So that was the first time I realized that it was really sad. It was really sad because... You can really hold a full conversation with her unless you just continue to keep talking. Mm-hmm. Be okay. But if you stopped, it would just start right over again. That's actually but. really similar to my mom. It, she will ask me, so what have you been up to lately? And yes. <laughs> when, and I always, I visit her, hold up, visit her on Mondays. And Mondays I go to the gym and I come home and I get ready my husband and I are Rotarians, so we go to our Rotary meeting, and then I go see her. So I'll tell her, oh, I went to the gym and did X. And then when she asks me again, I'll tell her, oh, we went to a Rotary. And then when she asks me the third time, I'll say, oh, what well, Rotary, we had such and such speaker. And But I generally take her out um, because a couple reasons. One is I spent all winter answering that question to the point where I wanted to, like, literally shoot myself in the head. And, you know, the she's in a memory care community, and it's just, after a while, I'm like, I can't deal with this place anymore. And obviously, spring, summer, the weather got much better, and we have regional parks and, and places that at least give her some mental stimulation. Either we can look at nature or watch kids, so that helps my poor brain, because answering those questions repeatedly is just, it's, yeah. it's murder. It doesn't do our brains any good either. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, as you mentioned that, I wonder, because when my grandmother turned 91, um, my aunt had a birthday party for her and invited people that were, like, not really people that she see very often. And it was just so strange, because I was looking at her wondering if she remembered any of us and if she was kind of freaking out about all these people kind of doting on her when she might not even know who they were. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, yeah, it was just strange. So I wonder if someone is going through that, is it good to have a lot of stimulation going on or more of just a slow kind of progressive environment? I don't know. 
I find, and, and a lot of people kind of bristle at this comparison, but when they get to the later stages, like my mom, unfortunately for me, my mom's only 75. So, and her mom lived with what I believe was undiagnosed Alzheimer's, which she got in her mid to late 70s, but she died at 91. So there are days I pray my mom doesn't live that long because I can't answer that question for another 15 yeah. years. <laughs> I know, um, I know. It's but, terrible to say, but it is true. Yeah, but it's kind of like you need to almost treat them like toddlers because, you know, if you ask them too many questions, their brain just can't process. And a lot of times, a lot of people living with Alzheimer's or dementia, they will get um, aggressive because, you know, if somebody was in your face asking you, you know, qu- you know re- repeated questions or a series of questions in a foreign language and you didn't understand it and they're like really trying to get you to answer them, you know, you might you might want to shove them away from you and be like, get away from me, I don't understand you. You know, so it yeah. can kind of understand why they get like that. And, you know, I learned when my daughter was little, you know, you ask them, do you want to wear this outfit or that outfit? And yeah. even sometimes... Too many options. Right? Yeah, and there's a gal that's not too far away from me here. I'm in California. Um, she's kind of known as the dementia whisperer. And I recently went to another talk she had locally and she said, you know, you have to think for them and it's not an insult. It's not demeaning to them. You know, if, if you ask them all kinds of questions and you get frustrated with them, you know, you're just creating a negative situation that they're going to be unhappy. You're going to be unhappy. And like, why would we want to do that? So she's, she's fantastic. So that was kind of a nice um, way of hearing. Is like you have to think for them. Um, it's hard because my mom resents it when I I don't really give her instructions, but I I give her pretty strong suggestions sometimes. Like yeah. it's ninety five degrees out. I really don't think you want to wear that sweater out to the park. <laughs> oh, so she'll get a little feisty. <laughs> well, yeah, she'll ask me. Well, how did you get to be in charge? And. <laughs> I, I don't respond with because your brain doesn't work anymore because I'm sure that wouldn't go over well. I usually tell her something like, I'm not really in charge. I'm just trying to help. You know, obviously you didn't realize it was hot outside or something. You know, I try to try to play it down a little bit so that she doesn't think that I'm just, you know, in there bossing her around. Um, but, that's, yeah. That's something that I come across a lot when talking with caregivers or children that are taking care of their aging parents that um, so many conversations are so hard to take place because the roles have changed where you are now trying to um, help them and I guess I, you could say you're trying to control what's going on for their own safety and it's very hard for a, you know aging adults to accept that or take it and hard for the kids too. Yeah. We run into that a lot with especially something like the um, personal medical buttons because it's something that has a stigma that says, well, I'm old and I can't be on my own without extra help and no one wants to admit it or, you know, they're in denial that they don't need it. And then it's extremely, you know, exactly what you're saying, a very hard conversation to not make them upset, um, but try to get your message across that you're just concerned for them and... um, it's Some, just tough all the way around, I think. Sometimes it helps to say, to, to phrase it as a, or like a request for them to help you. Like with my mom, mm-hmm. you know, she's very physically able-bodied, so she doesn't need like a fall button. But, you know, she can't be on her own because she can't remember. I mean, it, right. it wasn't that long ago. Her short-term memory is about two minutes. I'm beginning to think that she slipped a little bit recently, and it's okay. less than that. It's okay. you know, it's hard, kind of hard to know. They're renovating where she lives, so you know, I mean, paint, carpet, different furniture. I mean, that's hard enough for those of us that want that and and don't have cognitive yeah. have problems. But when you're you're already confused. Um, yeah. But if I, I'll tell her, you know, well, can you help me out by doing X? Or it would really help me if you would do blah, blah, blah. And I've heard that from other, um, like, Alzheimer's professionals. That's like, 
it, it keeps their dignity in place and they're more willing to, um, you know, to do it because they're helping you. So that might be something for your potential clients to approach their parents that way. Because I can see it's like I wouldn't want a fall device. I'm a cyclist and I wear a, um, an ID bracelet. You know, it's got my phone, my husband's phone and my daughter's phone in case I, you know, crash or get hit or something. My cell phone's always attached to my bike too, but that that's really obvious. And it's like, and I did have a crash a couple years ago. I was with friends, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like I was laying in the street by myself, thankfully. And I always get kind of mad at myself when I forget to wear it, even though I rarely go out by myself because it's like, you know, that's just for my safety. I don't, I don't want to like crash again and knock myself out and be laying in the gutter. Like, you know, no. but and that's the whole thing. Yeah. You, you don't want to wait till a serious accident like that happens. Yeah. And get something to help you. And it's hard to put that, um, you know, that perspective to a lot of people, but I understand it too. I mean, my mother lives alone, and she's very active, but God forbid if she fell down the stairs or something, and um, when would she get help if she couldn't get up? Yeah, and it's easy to do. I slipped down the stairs. Well, we've been in this house 11 years, so it's been more than a dozen years now. I mean, it was I think it was the middle of the night. I was going downstairs to get a glass of water, and I actually had a glass, drinking glass, in my hand, and I slipped on the carpeted stairs, and Uh slipped down about three or four, which thankfully I didn't fall all the way down, and I didn't drop the glass and shatter that on the tile and, you know, have a cut, you know, cutting situation. I mean, just, you know, and it was just, I was in my 40s, so it wasn't like I was feeble or, you know, it just, stuff can happen, and maybe that's another way to approach it with our, our seniors that we care about, because... You know, when my dad was on hospice, he oh, he refused to let the caregivers help him. And there was one step from the living room where he spent his time to get in the hallway to go down the hall to the bathroom. And, you know, he had three or four falls. And the hospice nurse that was in charge of him got really irate because he kept thinking they weren't, the caregivers weren't doing their job because he was falling. And I'm like, well, one, all the caregivers are average size or petite ladies and he's a grumpy old man who was a marine for four years and he doesn't want any help and they're trying to help him and he gets nasty in their face so it's it was a a really unfortunate situation for him but you know probably just frustrated with his situation i would assume yeah he was um falling and yeah, he was diabetic, and his donated kidney was failing, and he didn't want to go back on dialysis, which was fine, but he neglected to tell anybody that he probably should have been on dialysis, and over the course of three weeks, I talked to him, um, I was saw him November 1st, 2016, talked to him on election day, which was the 8th, and then my husband and I left town for my 50th birthday, and when I came back in town 10 days later, so this was like the 21st, um, I called him and I talked to him. And it was like I hung up and I told my husband, like, my dad is not doing real well. I mean, there's just there's something there. We're going to have to start paying more attention um, because I was concerned. And then he sent me an email that kind of questioned the whole phone conversation we had. And I thought that's kind of weird because I'd finally gotten him used to texting me. And we saw him a week later, a little less than a week later, and he thought it was 1998. So overnight, his memory went back, you know, 20 some odd years, and it was like, holy crap, I have two parents with dementia, I don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. It was, right. it was not fun. And unfortunately for him, he didn't understand what was going on. He thought he was recovering from the flu or a cold or whatever. And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> And he, a little bit more than that. Yeah, but. just a tiny bit. But he, you know, they had like the alarm that you put in the chair so when they get up, they're alerted. Because, of course, they were taking care of my mom. And my mom would hang out in the kitchen, so the caregivers would hang out in the kitchen. And my dad was in the other room. It, in hindsight, it wasn't really a great setup, and I don't know really how we would do it better. Um, but it is what it is. But he, you know, that... The chair alarm disappeared, like, within hours. 
So I can relate. <laughs> I can relate to what your clients go through. Yeah. So besides the fall is it pendant, right? It goes around their neck. Yes. Um, what other what other types of that's the only device that I'm familiar with besides the chair alarm one. What other what other devices are available nowadays? You said you have one for their if they're they don't have to be at home. That sounded interesting. Yeah. So we do have the um, the pendant where you can wear it around your neck, or you can have it on um, your wrist as a wristband. So those are the two options that you have. For the products, um, the one with the GPS, you can wear them with both. Air. But with the um, you're, you're going to have to repeat that because they cut out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. With the GPS unit, we have base, and you can use that. Um, as a pendant or as a wristband. Um, but if you choose to have the fall detection option, you can only really have that as a pendant. Um, fall detection, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't detect 100% of falls because sometimes it may seem like if you hit it on something, it could be a false detection. Um, so that's why we request that you have it as a pendant because if you've got it on your wrist, more of a chance to be hitting it on the table or yeah, or whatnot for fall. Which might must make it more difficult for men to want to buy into that device. Yeah, but you know what? When I see people wearing it, it's always men wearing them. <laughs> I I see them so much more often um, with the with the wristband. Yes, but um, everyone I see wearing them usually has it underneath their shirt, so um, they seem to be okay with it, and it's not really. I think the one that we have with the GPS is less than two ounces. I think it's like 1.5 ounces, so it's not heavy at all. So you really don't, um, it's not such a cumbersome thing that you've got around your neck. That sounds like an improvement from the help I've fallen and I can't get up commercial versions, which I think that was from the 90s or I'm not sure how far back that goes, but that's yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's my knowledge of, um, you know, fall devices. <laughs> Yeah, that's what everyone thinks. And as they, when they people say, you know, where are you working? What do you do? I say, well, I've fallen and I can't get up button. <laughs> but we really, really are trying to kind of break that stigma of the old lady laying on the bathroom floor, you know. It's more of a product that we want to tell people that we want you to stay active. So we don't want you just sitting in a chair because you're afraid to get up and do the things that you like to do because you don't have that extra security of, a help button. So, um, so the whole point of it really is so that you do keep active. I mean, the more active you keep, the more stronger you are, the more balance you have, and it just is an uh, you know, all-around better um, lifestyle for anyone of any age. So the whole point really is to keep yourself going and live life. That's true. And the um, the more active you are, the better it is for your brain. So. Yeah. I actually have a an episode that I'm going to talk. It's a guy I've talked to before, but um, there's been some research on active lifestyles. Is a they're finding that you know, geez, eat right and exercise, darn, no pill, gives you it. Um, it reduces your risk for dementias and Alzheimer's dramatically. Which for me, because I have three generations of cognitively impaired women. My mom, my grandmother, my great grandmother. So that's not real good uh, medical history for me. Right, so I right. try really hard to go to the gym or go out ride my bike at least six days a week. Yikes! <laughs> yeah, it's Eat healthy. Um, I, mean, I do that too. Mm-hmm. Um, now, are there ways to tell if you? Are there ways to tell if you do have um, a higher chance or any kind of indicators? prior to actually becoming diagnosed? Um, there is the, I think it's an EPO3 and 4 gene, so there's, there is a genetic component for some people. Oh, there um, is. okay. And I believe I've read recently that they're doing blood tests that can detect it, so that's something I need oh. to get with, but I need to do a little more research before I go to the doctor and say, okay, do a blood test and see if I'm at risk. Yeah, um, but then so what would you do differently? That's the point. It's yeah. like, um, other than plan ahead, 
because All right. my, you know, like I said, my dad, he was, you know, mentally fine. His physicality was mediocre because he was overweight and diabetic and he had all kinds of medical issues, but his mind was good and he took care of mom and there was really no planning for what would happen if he died first, which, you know, in hindsight, duh, that was probably going to happen. He was two years older. He was less physically healthy. You know, she's physically healthy. It's just her brain's no good. <laughs> and when he was on hospice, you know, my sister and I and our husbands to some degree, you know, we had to scramble around and figure out what to do, what to do with my dad, what, you know, it's like, holy Toledo. I mean, like literally planning by fire. It was, it was horrible. And, well, and talk about extra stress added on to a stressful situation. Yeah, it was not fun. Yeah. And uh-huh. doing this podcast, I've learned, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. There, I interviewed a gal who is living with Alzheimer's. She's about 10 years older than me, so I think she's about 62, 63. And she, um, you know, she had to quit working because she couldn't remember conversations she had with her team. Um, I think she was with Intel. I'd have to... It was one of the big tech companies like that, but I think that's the correct one. But she does, like, meditation, journaling. She eats right. She exercises. You know, she does absolutely everything she can do to forestall the worst of the cognitive impairment. So it should be interesting. How long has she had it? Um, About, let's see... About three or four years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's ter- it's terrible because she's not very old. And I interviewed a, a young guy whose mom was diagnosed at 51, which is how old I am right now. And then six yeah. months later, his grandmother was diagnosed. And I thought, oh, my. And he's 21. I'm like, ay, ay, ay. But just yeah. having, if you know, there are things you can do that will help. You know, it would have been nice if, like, I had suggested that my dad take my mom once or twice a week to the senior day program or the senior social programs because they're with people like them. It would have gotten her out of the house, which would have been good for her. It would have been really good for him, and I could not get him to to even go check it out. I did all the research, talked to him, found out all the details, The next step was to go and check it out. And the other thing with lack of planning on my parents' part is without even discussing it with me, my dad assumed my mom would come live with me. Now, I work from home, and when he was assuming this, my daughter still lived here. I didn't even have a spare bedroom. (laughs) And, you know, you start looking around your house for ways of making it safe, like my, my stove if you lean against the buttons on the front, you can turn on the gas burner without hardly moving. I mean, it's so ridiculously easy, and you'd think, well, why are you leaning against the stove? But if you're just in the kitchen having a conversation, and you lean over like, oh, I'll just kind of lean on the counter a little bit, boom, the burner's on. It's like, okay, that's no good. And I also back up to open space that I don't think my mom would venture out into, but you never know, and I can't yeah. fix that. I have a... 15-month-old golden retriever who hops the fence and runs around in the hill willy-nilly. So I can't, I can't keep him in. I don't know how I'd keep my mom in. So if you, if you knew in advance, there are a lot of things you could do that would make the time when you need a lot of attention, you know, I think it would make it better. I mean, if you went and looked at different assisted living and memory care communities, I think you might find that they're not warehouses for old people who have no memories. Oh, no. no, definitely not. I mean, a lot of, often people, they're so nice, and you've got your meals made, and it sounds great. Oh, and they have activities. The yeah. Where my mom lives, you know, if you go over to the assisted living side, the dining room was gorgeous before, and I, from what I've seen, it's going to be even nicer now. But they have, you know, Bible study, exercise, um day trips, games, you know, there's things for the men, there's activities, you know, discussions. I mean, I I, I go over there occasionally and just kind of see what's going on just for fun, but 
you know, even on the memory community side, the reason that I decided on that versus like a board and care home, which is cheaper and they're, I, I didn't verify it, but there were two listed in my neighborhood and I know that they've been here before. So I just didn't know if they were still here when I was looking around. But the reason I went with the memory community is because they have the same kind of activities. They have exercise, they have crafts, and it's all geared towards people who are challenged. And I thought, well, this is great. My mom was very creative, and, you know, she I figured she'd love it. Well, she doesn't do any of those stupid things, but she does sit around and talk with oh, the other ladies. I show up, you know, on Mondays, and she, not right now because they've dismantled the dining room, but when, it, when it's raised, we all put back together, so I'm assuming she'll go back to sitting at the table and talking with her friends. And, you know, I have this little tiny recording device, and what I'm trying to do is sneak in so that I can eavesdrop because I'm just uh, curious to find out what they talk about. Talk about, yeah. And how often do they repeat the same conversation? <laughs> but it's right. it's obviously oh, really... Well, that's true. I mean, you do kind of want to know if you're not around her all the time. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. Just That's my nature, but... You know, I've I've sat there with her friend and her, and, you know, they both repeat the same things over and over again. So I'm thinking, okay, if there's three or four of you, I don't even know how they have a conversation, but, you know, it's... it's they can I, talk all day. There's, everything's new. And I think they kind of do. Yeah. So it's actually not... It's not horrible. I mean, the day we moved her in, I was like, I wasn't sure what I was going to do because, you know, it was a little unnerving you know some of the residents were a little further gone her next door neighbor is irish and she speaks a um a combination of gibberish and irish and a smattering of english and she'll come up and talk at you and it's a clearly a sentence or a request or something i mean she's talking to you and you don't understand any of it and it's like <laughs> great <laughs> If you listen carefully, you can sometimes guess what she's asking, or there'll be one or two words, so you can at least respond to the one or two words, and you right. know, that way, you know, you can. yeah, because, you know, if, if you came up to somebody and started talking at them, and they just looked at you and walked away, you'd be kind of annoyed. Yeah. And yeah. she's a really That's sweet lady. Yeah, so you don't want to frustrate them, but, so you have the two different devices, or are there any more? Um, well, those are the, the three options that we have um, for the devices that you can, so either in the home or outside the home. So if you're out and about often and you don't have um, someone with you, you know, if you're still very active, but often out, you know, whether you're going for a walk or whatnot on your own, we suggest the um, iSafe, which has the GPS. And then um, if you're just in your home and that's when you're alone most of the time, then we have one that you... Either you have a landline phone or a cellular phone in the um, unit that's just inside your home. And both of them have the fall detection. Um, what I was going to say is I think you're right on the point with knowing what's available before you need it and planning before it's too late. Um, and the one thing that I've really learned is that I have no idea, like you're saying with dementia, people getting it so early in life um, and with, you know, my family members in their early 60s and finding out that maybe one out of three or four adults over the age of 65 fall every year, and that is such a high number. I had no idea. Um, and, try, and not thinking that that would ever be a problem that would be so common at such a young age um, was one thing, um, but then when you were mentioning the daycares, and um, we work with a lot of council on aging, and they have so many resources available that um, I had absolutely no idea about, and I think that taking advantage of learning as much as you can, basically like what you're doing with sharing these podcasts, so people are aware of what's out there, what may be in their near future, um, and how to address it before it happens. Because, like you're saying, bringing her, your mom to a new place to live is very unnerving, and you want to make sure you know what you're doing before you rush right into it, like you were saying with um, 
with your dad and your mom yeah. and moving and whatnot. It's just um, well, preventing falls and yeah, and the and if they have a fall, you know, getting them help as soon as possible is so. That's to me. That's almost a number one thing to to consider yeah. as your family members age and. You know, I'm getting, like, I'll be 52 in a couple months, and it's like, oh, okay. I actually worked with a personal trainer who was about 12 or so years older than me, and she was very focused on also doing things that maintained your balance. And most of the instructors at my gym throw in balance exercises because they're all, none of them, one of them just turned 50 like a month ago, and I don't know exactly how old the other gal I see, but they're like 41 and older. So they're not like young 20-somethings that have no clue what it's like to get older. <laughs> and, <laughs> All right. You know, and it's, they're still young enough to be able to be extremely active that way. I guess yoga and tai chi and all that I hear of is really, really good. Um, but with the falling, it, it, that's a lot of what we at Alert Century focus on and try to explain and prepare people for. Uh, fall assessments that we can provide to them for um, exactly what you're talking about with the stove, with the stove and making sure that everything in your home, whether it's, um, you know, the bathroom, the kitchen, uh, the the bedroom, the three main rooms that they're in quite a bit, uh, making sure that everything is accessible and um, everything from the throw rugs are, you know, removed or mats put down where no one's slipping and tripping, um, to, you know, the proper lighting and um, sturdy furniture, all that type of stuff that you might not think of. Um, We've got all the information right together that we really try to make sure that the caregivers are aware of, so. Yeah, I was, I I did an episode, I actually did three separate episodes on home safety, because once I started researching it, I was like, holy Toledo, well, Two of the three episodes were more on what to do physically with the home for safety, and I was stunned to learn that the bedroom was this number two place for falls. And once it was explained, because you go from laying down to sitting up or standing up, so you, you know some people get dizzy if they do that too quickly, I was like, oh, that makes sense, and usually the lighting is uh, more dim. So... It made sense once I learned why, but I would not have thought that the bedroom would have been one of the more dangerous rooms in the house. So it's great that you guys also offer that service because, you know, it's, I think most people, you know, it's kind of like baby proofing, you know what you should do, but maybe you don't do it a hundred percent until like, I didn't put the plugs and the plug covers in until my daughter was actually crawling. And then literally it was like chasing her around the house. Right. <laughs> and you definitely do go out the way you came in. It's crazy. It is. <laughs> but yeah, yes. the fall assessment on the homes is so important um, to just try to minimize any kind of accident before it happens. Um, but even after you do all that, if someone still falls, you know, just because you've, uh, you know, uh, uh, protected the house from as much as you could, you still need your loved one to be able to reach help. And, you know, a grab bar isn't going to help them when they're on the floor and they can't reach it, and the button is exactly what will. So it is the most important thing that you would need for someone living on their own that, you know, has a chance of falling. And then we always kind of joke that when, if you do have an injury or, or whatever, if you go to the hospital and you're, put it, you're admitted into a room, what is the first thing that they give you? The button, say, press this if you need the nurse, press this if you need anything. Yeah. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing. That's true. And I'm sure I can think of, off the top of my head, Uh three different stories of people who fell and had negative consequences. One was a client. His dad went out for a walk and didn't return. Well, he did more than fall, but basically they found him in the park on the ground and he'd had a heart attack, and he was gone. But if he had yeah. just fallen, it could have been, you know, how long might he have laid there? My husband's yeah. grandmother fell and was on the floor for three days before the neighbors realized something was going on and went over and checked. Wow. And yeah, that's bad. Oh, but the, the third one is the worst. This uh, client, I think it's a client of my husband's, 
the, I guess the wife had a heart attack and he tried to catch her and she landed on top of him and I guess she wasn't a petite lady. And allegedly, the story is, is that he laid underneath her for seven days before somebody realized something was wrong. And I'm like, oh, oh my God. I'm like, well, oh. you usually can't survive longer than three days without water. So I'm not sure about the validity of that. But even if it was seven hours, that's probably about Almost. six hours and 50 yeah. minutes more than you need. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. I'm sure you have just hundreds of horror stories you could tell people. <laughs> yeah. Well, the statistics definitely say that within that, uh, they call it the golden hour of you getting help within the first hour of um, injuring yourself that um, I think one out of six people will end up um, coming home healthier and quicker than someone that doesn't receive the help. Um, but yeah, we've heard tons of stories of things like that, and they say, I was talking with my boss, Glenn, who owns the company, and he said that, um, he, has, oh, he said the, the most common place to fall is in the shower, obviously, because it can be slippery. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you, he said it's also a good place to fall because you've got water, and if you're cold, you can have the hot water, and then you've got water to keep hydrated. Um, but a funny story is he had told me that a woman that he was pretty close with as a client, and she said, I, I thought I was wrinkly before, but after I fell, I think she was stuck in there for six hours or oh. something crazy like that. She goes, talk about wrinkly, when yeah. she finally got help to get out. Like, oh my gosh. It just goes on and on with the crazy stories. It it is scary. Um, But just the thought of thinking of someone being stuck without help and injured and in pain. Yeah. Any amount of time is awful. Awful, awful. Yeah, I've thought about that because I ride my bike from my house to two separate locations to meet up with our group. And, of course, there's road construction. So I either have to go the long way, which is a little, little bit remote, Or I have to kind of zigzag through some of the traffic and cross at crosswalks and across some busy streets and stuff. And, you know, every so often in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, well, if I crashed, could I get to my cell phone that's attached to the handlebars? And, you know, like I said, I'm not that old and I have very good balance and I don't have any physical problem. But I, I do think about that sometimes, so... You know, it's, oh, you should. Yeah. yeah. And I, a lot of people will tell that to me, too, where they say, well, I have my cell phone, so I can call 911. But, um, you know, if you do fall and you can't reach it or whatever the situation is, you always can usually reach something that's right on you, that stays on you as dependent. Um, and another good point about that is when you press the button um, and when you register up to receive the service, you give us all the pertinent information that we need. So we already know your name, your health conditions, uh, where you keep your medicine, um, who to reach as a responder. So really all you have to do is push the button and help is sent to you. But if you're you know, injured and you, you do grab your cell phone, you've got to go through where you are, who you are, what you need, all that type of stuff, who else to call, and it just can become a, a stressful situation if you've you know, really taking a fall off your bike or whatnot, but... Yeah, that actually makes sense. Be aware. Mm-hmm. Now you're making me think I need one of those for bike rides. <laughs> what? It doesn't mean you're old. It no, it does active. not. You want to stay active. <laughs> my husband frequently uses the Find My Friends app on the iPhones to see where I'm at, which drives me slightly yeah. batty, because I refer to it as the Stalk My Wife app. I know, I know, but but he knows like that because I run and I want if I don't come home, I want you to find me. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how the road ID uh, bracelets came about. The guy that inter- uh-huh. um, invented them uh-huh. went out for a run, and I f- don't remember the story a hundred percent, but his dad said something about being careful or whatever, and you know he was in his twenties, and so of course you get a flippant answer and. I guess he came around a curve and some car, like, swerved at him, probably didn't see him right away, and he landed in a ditch, and when he woke up, he couldn't reach his phone, and, you know, and he laid there for quite a while, and that's when he realized, I need to do something different about this, and that's how, that's the name of the company is Road ID, and they're just the little rubber bracelets with the, the metal piece that's got your name and 
you know, two different contact and, you know, it's, you, it's all personalized. So it's, you know, at least if somebody finds me, my phone's there with contacts in it and I have the road ID on, but you know, if you're laying there for hours, that's not cool. Oh, I think, geez, the amount of recovery you're going to have from that. And they also have those bracelets, right, for um, if you're allergic to things, I think, too, right? I don't know if they can put that on the road ID or not, but... Um, you can. Uh, you can, yeah. I would, yeah, because it's, they're 100% personalized. And then you can get little charms that go on the sides of the little ID part. So I've got, like, a little... Oh, yeah. Um, couple little, one of them's got, it says, I heart you, and... Mm-hmm. Um... The text is really small, so I know which side of my wrist the the one the heart charm goes on, because <laughs> I can't read it without glasses on. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, which is... Uh, and all that stuff, again, it's being aware of it and knowing that it's available and just protecting yourself for sure. But, yeah, it's all... I mean, we. I have a button myself. I don't always wear it, but I do have it, and... I like having it because if I do have an emergency, all you have to do is push the button, and they'll know where I am with the GPS. Yeah, it makes it's perfectly a, good sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's also like, you know, what we say with anything from, like, medical or, or like, car insurance, you don't really yeah. use it. You don't need it till you need it. Right. That's exactly what I'm saying. It's <laughs> the same thing with the uh, um, medical buttons. It's the same thing as that... You're going to be so happy you have it when you need it. You can't plan for accidents. That is very true. And that's that's yeah. kind of my whole purpose for my first season of this podcast, which is what I'm doing, is educating people on, you know, mm-hmm. like I know I have risk factors because of the family history. And so I specifically do things to hopefully lower all those risk factors. But, you know, as I get... You know, maybe into my early 60s, there'll probably be some other planning, you know, just in case. Um, because right. I'm not putting my husband and my daughter through what my sister and I went through because that's just unnecessary. And, you know, there's there's so much information out there. If you know where to look, the best place, oh, that's the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the best place to start is the Alzheimer's Organization Association's website. It's ALZ.org. I mean, even a cognitively impaired person can remember that. <laughs> yeah. They have tons of information, but I started a podcast because sometimes doing deep dives on the internet takes forever, and if you've got your loved one at home and they're over there bugging you while you're trying to figure out how to deal with them, you know, it's easier to, you know, put in one earbud and listen to a podcast while you deal with them and all the other household, you know, everyday things that need to be done, so that was how, that was how Fading Memories was born. I was... Yeah. I was I was looking for a podcast like mine, and it wasn't out there. So I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's kind of how our century started, where Glenn, his grandmother fell, and she was in the driveway in the cold for about six hours, and he couldn't find exactly what he wanted so other people wouldn't go through it. So he did it himself. Yeah. We are. But, yeah, I think that's great. I, and with a, a podcast and all that stuff, you can listen to it in the car, wherever, nowadays. Yeah, you, I listen to podcasts while I make dinner, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, you know, doing other chores. I don't sit and listen to them because that would, if I sit still and listen to them, I fall asleep. Um, <laughs> you have to be, like, killing two birds with one stone. Well, yeah, it's like if I'm going to sit still and do something, I'll probably watch TV or read a book. But, yeah, no, I, you know, you in the car, yeah. you know, if you're at the doctor waiting, you know, while your loved one's, you uh-huh. know, being examined... It's yep, it's the way to go. It's just you know, it's it's a really booming um, factor. You know, part of the technology world. Every time I turn around, there's like, oh, now some. You know, I order tea from Harney and Sons. They have a podcast, uh-huh. and it's like every time I turn around, people that I I use their products or follow them on social media or whatever now it's like oh well now that person's got a podcast i know so Many, uh, the way of the future they're super popular well it keeps your interest because it's not just an image yeah and it's you get the- i listen to one that's called california true crimes and it's just two people discussing in detail like a crime that happened obviously in california and it's it's oh, really yeah. interesting. Their very first episode was happened to be a crime that a murder, a double murder that happened in my hometown, and oh, fabulous. And it was <laughs> it was in like I think 1998, so it was only 
was that 20 years ago? So even my daughter kind of remembered it a little bit. She's almost 27. Uh-huh. So she's like, so I kind of think I remember some of that. I'm like, oh, that's lovely because <laughs> it was pretty gruesome. Uh-huh. And it's just, crazy. you know, it's because I work from home and it's me and the three dogs. So it's <laughs> when I'm, I'm a photographer by profession. And while I'm retouching portraits, I would listen to podcasts. And it's kind of, it's like, it's like having other people kind of in the room. You're listening, and it's it's interesting, and there's so many out there. I, I don't have enough hours in the day to listen to them. <laughs> I know. I know. You could just go on and on. But it is great to be able to catch and learn uh, so easily. Yeah. Learn yourself. Yeah, and it's, there's so many that, you know, you can learn. I've learned a lot. Just, you know, I follow different ones on politics, and it's like, oh, Okay, I learned like about the Iran deal because I'm like I don't I don't know anything about it. I don't know if it's good, bad, or indifferent. And after listening to a couple different people's podcasts, I learned okay. Now I have an educated opinion on this. Uh-huh. So that's that's the goal of my podcast is help educate people because, like you said, well, if you know that you have you know the potential of getting Alzheimer's or dementias, or you do have it and you're in the very early stages, what do you do? And it's like well, at least there's easy ways to learn what to do, and that's what I do. Right, yeah. So important. Yeah. Well, it was terrific talking to you. Yeah, I appreciate and you reaching out to me. It was great talking with you also, and I've learned a little myself, too. <laughs> that's, well, that's great, then. We, we yeah. helped each other this afternoon. And I will, I will send you a link when it's, well, I'll send you the link when I upload it. Okay. So that you can share it and hear it and all that good stuff. That sounds great. All righty. Well, you have a fantastic weekend. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. (laughs) Bye. Bye. So as you heard, this conversation went in kind of a different direction than you might suspect. I think it was super helpful. There's common themes that I'm noticing with these episodes. Planning ahead, safety, keeping active, All of these things are extremely important as we age. They're important if we have a family member with cognitive impairment. They're just important information to get. One last thing I'd like to mention, there is a new page on the Fading Memories podcast website. It's linked also in the show notes. It's called Favorite Things. Currently, it links to all of the books that I've read in learning how to live with Alzheimer's with my mom and help take care of her. I found all these books tremendously helpful and that is why I created this page so that you had a one-stop location to order whatever you think might help you and I hope that you take a look at it. Once again, thanks so much for listening and I will talk to you again next week. There's so much useful information out there and so much we need to know to take care of our parents and our own families. And I know sometimes it's really hard to gather all this information together in a short period of time in a way you can access easily. And that's the whole point of this podcast. I share what I've learned taking care of my parents and especially my mom and all the researching of information I do for these podcast episodes. I hope you're finding them useful and hopefully a little entertaining as well. If you are, could you do me a favor? Can you go to Apple iTunes and leave a rating or even a quick review? This is how new people find my podcast, and I can't be a supportive podcast if people don't know about me. As always, I'll chat with you again next week. MBK Senior Communities is dedicated to being the preferred senior living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life serving others the way they prefer to be treated and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit. 
You can get more information by visiting their website at mbkseniorliving.com or call 949-242-1400.